This sermon is titled The Cross of Jesus Christ, The Triumph of the Cross, Part 1. Be enriched as you listen. As we continue meditating on the cross of Christ and what the Lord Jesus did for us on the cross uh, this Sunday today, as well as Good Friday, I just want to bring our attention to two important things that the Lord accomplished for us on the cross. We'll look at one today, and we'll look at the other on Good Friday. The cross as a means of punishment was something that was started way back around 600 BC, historically, uh, by the Assyrians. So they were there in that region around uh, the Middle East. So they started using crucifixion as a way of punishing people. This was continued by the Babylonians and then the Greeks. And uh, we are familiar with Alexander the Great. Uh, he, in fact, as he, his territory extended crucifixion, or the, the crucifixion as a way of punishment was then extended all the way up to Rome. And so, the Romans continued this tradition on all the way past the time of Christ, and it was finally Emperor Constantine the first, which who around 480 abolished crucifixion. He put an end to it. He said, "We are no, we are no, we are no longer going to use this as a way to punish people." But the point is, it was carried out for a long period in in human history as a way to punish people. The Romans, of course, never did that to their own citizens. They always did it for other people whom they felt deserving uh, of this. But uh, it was a very painful way to punish somebody. Anywhere from six hours sometimes to four days before they actually died because of all the multiple injuries and the pain and all the things that took place on the cross. So as we reflect on the cross, we are very aware that the cross was cruel. It was painful. There was great agony, great suffering. And yet, the power of the cross is not in the physical suffering of Christ per se, but it is in what happened spiritually on the cross. There's great work that was done spiritually. And while we typically look at the cross as a place of great suffering, trial, and pain, what the Bible communicates to us is this, and this is something all of us must have deep down in our hearts, that the cross of Jesus was the place of the greatest triumph. It was a place of the greatest triumph ever known to man. And that's what I want to focus on today. And focus on one aspect of that triumph today, and we'll look at the other one next Sunday, uh, next on Friday. So when we go back to the Garden of Eden, and we recognize that through Adam's sin, through the fall, Adam subjected us to sin, Satan and death. He subjected us to sin, Satan, and death. It's called the fall. He put us under sin, Satan, and death. The Bible says in Romans 5 verse 12, For by one man sin came into this world, and death through sin, and death passed upon all, for all have sinned. By one man, sin came, death, and death passed on all. So every human person was plunged into this predicament, into this situation of being subjected to sin, Satan, and death. So much so that in the very beginning, as God speaks to Cain, the son of, one of the sons of Adam and Eve, in Genesis 4 verse 7, God tells him, Cain... If you do well, 
you will be accepted. But God is warning Cain. Sin is lurking at the door. It wants to control you, but you must master it. Sin is waiting to gain control of your life. And you can see the heart of God. He says, I want you to master it. I want you to control. I want you to have dominion over sin. But sadly, that never happens. What we know is sin controlled and continues to control every human person. Sin dominates. Sin controls us. And that's continued on through till today. The Apostle Paul, a very devout Jew, highly trained, scholarly, studied the law, he understood everything, a very devout man. He called himself a Hebrew of the Hebrews, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, meaning he's so committed to the law of God, so committed to wanting to follow God and do what's right in the eyes of God, yet he expresses his own struggle with sin. He writes for us in Romans chapter 7. He says this, verse 15, For what I am doing, I do not understand. Sounds like you and me. I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> For what I am doing, I have no idea. <laughs> Sounds so much like you and me. But this is Paul. For what I'm doing, I do not understand. And he continues. For what I will to do, that I do not practice, but what I hate, that I do. Hey, you and I relate to that. He says, what I hate, that's what I end up doing. What I want to do, the good I want to do, the things that are pleasing to God, I want to do that, I just can't do it. And he continues. Verse 17. But now, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Now, he's not making an excuse. He's not putting the monkey on the other person's back. That's not the point. What he's saying is, I am recognizing that there is something stronger than me. There is sin dwelling in me. So think about this. A man who is so deeply religious, so highly educated, he studied the law, he knows this, but he's recognized that there is something that's still controlling me. And of course, Paul is writing this in his unregenerate state. That means before he has come to faith in Christ as a Jew living under the law. This is my problem. I've got sin in me. And so the good that I want to do, I can't do it. What I don't want to do, the thing I hate, I end up doing. And I don't understand what's going on. And then he continues. He says, verse 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So many of us can relate to this. And I've sat with men, women across the table, some of them with master's degrees, some with a PhD, some with multiple master's degrees, highly educated, and yet their life has been ruined because of some sin. Maybe given to alcohol, uncontrolled, cannot control that. Something else, cannot control it. And here is a person so brilliant in mind, 
achieved great things, but totally ruined, marriage ruined, family ruined, gone, simply because there is sin that has controlled them, and they feel so powerless, which means education itself cannot take care of this. Religion cannot help solve this. There is sin that's dwelling, controlling, and sometimes it so ruins people's lives. They are good people, intelligent people, and yet there is something that has ruined them. So, the cross of Jesus Christ, as we said, is God's answer to the fall. The fall subjected us to sin, Satan, and death. The cross is God's answer to sin, Satan, and death. And I want what I really want all of us to understand deep down in our hearts is that the cross, which was a place of great trial, it's also the place of the greatest trial. Because it was on the cross that the power of sin over our lives was broken. It was on the cross. The cross is God's answer to sin, Satan, and death. And this controlling power of sin over our lives was broken at the cross. And so we can say this. On the cross, the power of sin over your life was broken. On the cross. Let's say this together. On the cross, the power of sin over my life was broken. How did God do it? Paul explains this to us in Romans chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. Romans chapter 6, verse 6 and 7. Paul says, Knowing this, it's so important to know the truth. Jesus said, If you continue in my word, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. This truth sets us free. Paul said, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, so that we no longer should be slaves of sin. Now, there are some very old English terms that I use here in this verse, which may, we may not be able to relate to it. So let's translate this verse. Paul says, know this, that our old man, referring to the sin that was working in us, the old sinful nature, our old man, sin in us, was crucified with him. So when Jesus was crucified, it was not just Him being hung there on the cross and His body suffering and feeling all of that pain. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, something was being done in the spiritual realm. God Almighty was nailing that sin nature that controlled you and me and putting an end to it on the cross. Knowing this, that our old man, that old sinful nature, was crucified with him. So that the body of sin, translation, power of sin, the control of sin, the dominion of sin, might be done away with. God got rid of it. And what's the outcome? We 
should no longer be slaves of sin. Adam put us in subjection to sin. God said, I'll take care of it on the cross. What controlled you and me was put to death, was brought to an end, was nailed on the cross. And God said, you are free from the control and the lordship of sin over your life. Amen. The point is, we need to know it. Paul said, know this. That your old man was crucified with him. That the body of sin might be done away with, so that we no longer should be slaves of sin. Verse 7, for he who is dead is freed from sin. That sin that dwelt in you was put to death, is dead. And so you are free from sin. Amen. The triumph of the cross. The triumph of the cross. So on the cross, Jesus Christ triumphed over the dominion of sin over our lives. He did it for your sake and mine. He was Lord. He was holy. He was already Lord over sin. Sin couldn't touch Him. But He had to take care of it for you and me. And so on the cross, he broke the power of sin. Paul continues in Romans 6 and verse 14. He says, For sin will, let's read it together. For sin will not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. Sin will no longer have dominion over you. Under law, you were told what was right, but you were not empowered in it. You couldn't do it. And the grace, God says, I'll take care of the work for you. You just walk in it. So under grace, God deals with the power of sin. He nails it to the cross. He breaks the power of sin. He sets us free from the control of sin. And he says, walk in it. I did the work. You enjoy it. That's grace. And so Paul says, you're not under the dominion of sin. As a believer, you need to know the triumph of the cross. You need to know what Jesus Christ did for you and me on the cross. You need to know that whatever sin that supposedly controls you, that supposedly is ruining you in your mind, in your emotions, in your body, sometimes maybe even affecting you in your finances, and your relationships, whatever sin that's dominating you, you need to know the truth that actually that sin has no dominion over you. Because Christ broke its power on the cross. And He has already set you free. He's already set you free. So the cross is your place of freedom and dominion over sin. Let's say this together. The cross... Okay, say it like you believe it. The cross is my place of freedom and dominion over sin. Let's say it again. The cross is my place of freedom and dominion over sin. See, God didn't come up with a seven-step process. He had just one place. <laughs> just step in front of the cross. I'll take care of it. Just get there in front of the cross. It's your place. Is my place of freedom from the dominion of sin and, from the, and our place of freedom and dominion. Romans 8, verses 1 through 4. The Apostle Paul continues. He says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law... Of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. 
Let's translate this verse. The word law, just look at it as dominion, influence. For the dominion or the influence of the spirit of life in Christ has set me free from the dominion or the influence of sin and death. That means the Holy Spirit dominating you and me, living in you and me, Holy Spirit, He sets us free from the dominion of sin and death. Amen. Then he continues, verse 3. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. Meaning the law could not empower the flesh. The law said, this is the right thing to do. The flesh was so weak, couldn't do it. So God took care of that. He said, God, what the law could not do, God did. By sending his own son in the form of sinful flesh. And the, he, he came, he took on this flesh and blood body. And on account of sin, he condemned sin. The word condemned is to pass judgment, to sentence, to put an end to. He condemned sin in the flesh, that is in the body of Christ. So when Christ was nailed to the cross, sin was sentenced. Sin was judged and condemned and said, your power is broken for the lives of people. And he continues in the next verse, therefore, the righteous requirement of the law, that means whatever the law wants, whatever the law states, the righteous requirement of the law is now fulfilled in us. That means we can do it. Before, the law said, Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt, whatever. The long list was there. The law was there. We wanted to do it, we couldn't do it because sin controlled us. Then came the cross where the power of sin was broken. And now here you are, you and me, people filled with the Holy Spirit and the righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled by us. We can live the way God wants us to live. We don't commit adultery. We don't commit, you know, we don't steal. We don't lie. We don't do any of that and much more because we walk in the Holy Spirit. We walk empowered by the Spirit. Are you listening? So as a believer, understand what Christ has done for you and me. So let's Personalize this. Let up, let's apply this. What is your sin problem? Anger, jealousy, pride, bitterness, hatred, lust, covetousness. What is your sin problem? Or is it immorality? Is it your uncontrolled sexual appetites? Is it Addictions to some form of substance or alcohol or something else. What is your sin problem? You need to know the triumph of the cross. That Jesus Christ on the cross broke the power of that sin over your life. And the truth is that sin has no dominion over you. Has no dominion. And don't believe this lie, it's in my DNA. Listen, God designed you good. Don't believe that lie. Oh, it's my environment. Look, we all are in the same environment. <laughs> Whatever that sin is, its power over your life was broken. Sin will not have dominion over you. I'm not saying there will not be temptation. We are in a sinful world. 
We are in a world where there is all kinds of evil around us. So temptation comes knocking. But you and I know the truth that the power of sin, the control of sin that once dominated the flesh was nailed to the cross so that on the cross Jesus Christ triumphed over sin itself on your behalf and mine so that we could be free from sin and live by the Spirit. Live free from the dominion of sin over our lives. He did it. So, know the truth because the truth will set you free. Sets us free. What is it that's controlling you? What is it that you say, I don't understand why I'm doing it. I don't want to do it, but I still end up doing it. That sin actually has no power over you. Its power over your life was broken on the cross. So how do you walk in this freedom? I want to just bring our attention to four simple things you and I can do to appropriate this. The cross is your place of freedom and dominion over sin. Let's say it again. The cross is my place of freedom and dominion over sin. How do we appropriate this? Number one, you believe in what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. Believe in this. Now, our logical mind finds this very difficult because, hey, somebody died 2,000 years ago in a manner that was just customary of that time. Thousands of people were crucified. How can this one particular man who was crucified 2,000 years ago affect my life today? Because the point is, it's not about his physical suffering. The point is about the spiritual reality that took place on that same cross when Christ was crucified. That's it. You believe in what the Bible says. You believe in what God says, I did for you on the cross. I triumphed over sin itself. I broke the power of sin so that you can be free. And sin does not have to enslave you. And sin does not have to ruin you. So believe in that. Secondly, receive it for yourself. See, many times when you listen to a sermon, you say, yes, pastor, preach it stronger. It's for the person next to me. Or preach it stronger. My so-and-so is watching you online. Yes, pastor, he needs to hear it. I understand that. But don't think this message is for somebody else. It's for you. For me. Personally. Receive for yourself. Receive for yourself. When Jesus hung there on the cross, he had you in his mind. Your name was there on the cross. God had you in mind. He did it for you personally. He did it for me. So he said, Jesus, this is for me. I am struggling with this thing in my life. I am struggling with this problem, this sin in my life. And Jesus, I receive it for me. That this sin, its power over my life was broken. And thirdly, Paul explains to us that we need to declare as ours what Jesus did on the cross. He continues in Romans chapter 10, verse 6. He says, But the righteousness that comes by faith, it doesn't speak like this. It doesn't say, Who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. You see, sometimes we're thinking, Jesus has to come down to deliver me. He doesn't need to do that. He did it once already. So do not say, who shall ascend into heaven to bring Christ down from above? Or who shall descend into the abyss as though to bring Christ up from the dead? He's not there. He's risen already. So don't speak like that. God has to come down. You know, sometimes we sing, oh, God, come down. Hey, He already came. You know, I understand what you're singing. But the reality is, He came already. 
He already came. So don't pray, oh God, come down. Oh God, please rise up. Okay, I know we sang a rise, but you know, <laughs> it's a different context. Okay. I mean, you don't, you're not speaking hopelessness. But he says, verse 8, the word is near you. The word that you just heard right now, it's near you. You heard the word, sin will not have dominion over you. You heard the word that the power of sin was broken on the cross. You heard the word, this word is near you. It's in your heart and it's in your mouth that if you will believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus, and if you will confess with your mouth that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. When you believe in your heart, it puts you in a place of right standing with God. It positions you to receive from God. But you got to do one more thing. You confess with your mouth. You declare with your mouth what you believe in your heart. You declare that sin will not have dominion over you. You declare that the power of sin over your life was broken. You declare it because confession is made unto salvation. For you to experience a saving, delivering, healing work of Jesus Christ, you need to make confession unto to salvation. Are you understanding? So you believe it in your heart and you say it with your mouth. So you look at that sin that's troubling you, that addiction that's, that's controlling you, uh, that evil thing that's ruining your life, and you say, sin, I speak to you in the name of Jesus. Your power over my life has been broken. Your addictive behavior, I speak to you in the name of Jesus. Your power over my life is broken. You will no longer have dominion over me because I believe what Jesus did for me on the cross. I believe that sin was nailed, was crucified on the cross, that the power of sin over my life should be broken, and I will no longer be a slave to sin. So you speak to it. You say, you are no longer my master. I am no longer your slave. Jesus Christ has set me free, and the dominion of the Holy Spirit in my life enables me to walk free from the dominion of sin and death. You need to believe it in your heart, and you need to confess with your mouth. You need to declare it. Speak to that sin. Speak to that controlling in whatever that you feel controlled by. Don't let it control you. Don't let it influence you. Don't let it ruin your life. God's provided a way. And lastly, number four, live out of this. Live out of what Jesus completed for you and me on the cross. Worship team, please come. Live out of this. Paul says in Romans 8, he continues, he says, Brethren, I want you to know something. We are not debtors to the flesh to live out of the flesh. That means you are not obligated. You don't owe the flesh anything. The world and all the sin around may stir up some unclean desires in your flesh, but you are not a debtor to the flesh. You don't owe the flesh anything. We are not debtors to the flesh. It says, but we don't have, and so we don't live by the flesh. Verse 13. But if you live by the flesh, you will die. But if you by the Holy Spirit put an end to the deeds of your body, you will live. Meaning, the Holy Spirit empowers me. You may feel the urge, you may feel the pull, you may feel the tension in your flesh, you may feel the desire, but you look at your flesh and say, flesh, I don't owe you anything. I'm not a debtor to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. But I, by the Holy Spirit, bring an end to the sinful deeds of my body, and I live that way. Are you listening? This is the Christian life, the normal Christian life. We live by the Spirit, not according to the flesh. And we can because Jesus did the work on the cross. So today, we have looked at one aspect of the triumph of the cross. That on the cross, Jesus triumphed over sin itself. Now remember, He, he didn't need to do the cross for Himself. Everything on the cross was done with you in mind, with me in mind. He triumphed over sin. 
so that you and I could be free from sin. And sin no longer can enslave us. Sin no longer sh should ruin our lives. But we can, by the Holy Spirit, live free from sin. Amen. As a believer, I want you to know this truth. Because knowing the truth is what sets you permanently free. All permanent change comes from inside. By knowing the truth, believing the truth, embracing the truth for yourself, and then declaring that truth as real in your life. All permanent change comes from inside you. But the truth of God put in your heart. We're going to take some time to worship and pray. I'm going to pray from here. And today, if you as a believer, you walked in this place, and you know that there is some sin controlling your life, and this is not to put you down, but this is to tell you, today, you can step into your life of freedom. Because sometimes believers are living bound to sin. And the enemy has taken advantage and unclean spirits control their flesh and their minds and their emotions. And they find themselves helpless against addictive behaviors and uh, their desire, desires that they know that it's not right. They come to church, go back, do the same thing. Why? Because you have not received the truth. Because if you know the truth, the truth sets you free. But today you've heard the truth. And you're going to be set free. Amen. We're going to pray. And as we pray, I want you to ask the Lord, Lord, I receive the truth of your word. The Bible says that sin was crucified on the cross. I believe it. That whatever sin is controlling me, it may be an emotional thing, a physical thing, whatever. Its power was broken on the cross. I'm receiving that truth. I'm receiving this truth, God, that sin will not have dominion over me. I'm free from it. I'm going to walk in this truth. I'm going to walk in it. And you can. You can. Let's rise to our feet, please. There's nothing stronger, nothing higher, nothing greater than the name of Jesus. All the honor, all the power, all the glory to the name of Jesus. There's nothing strong.
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, your word has been proclaimed. Your truth has been delivered. And no word from God is empty or void of power. Every word that you speak, God, is full of power. And Father, right now we pray over every person here in this hall, everyone watching. And we pray that right now every chain of sin, whether it's sin in the flesh or sin in the emotions and desires and appetites, that every chain will be broken. That we, your people, will walk in the liberty with which Christ has set us free. That we, your people, will step in to this provision of the cross to walk in freedom from sin itself. And so in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I take authority over every evil spirit, every spirit of uncleanness, every spirit that has gained access into people's lives because of sin. And I command you out today in the name of Jesus. Every spirit that enslaves, every spirit that holds people in addictions and, and immorality, I command you out in the name of Jesus. Let the people of God be free. Let the people of God be free. And Father, we receive the truth that sin will not have dominion over us. Because we are not under the law, we are under grace where the work has been completed and given to us. I declare over every person that sin will no longer have dominion over you. Sin will no longer have dominion over you. The dominion of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the dominion of sin and death. I declare in the name of Jesus, you are free from addictive behaviors. You are free from your addictions. You are free from your enslavements. You are free from the traps and the cords of sin. In the name of the Lord Jesus, and let the power of the Holy Spirit come upon you. Let the anointing of the Holy Spirit come upon you because the anointing breaks every yoke and removes every burden. The anointing of God sets you free. And Father, we thank you. We bless you, O oh God. We honor you. We thank you. You know, this past month we have been spending weekday evenings in worship and prayer. And we received a testimony this, this last week. On Tuesday, uh, there was this person from our North Church and her nephew was on Tuesday they went to the hospital ultrasound they found him with kidney stones on Thursday while we were praying they sent the request online we prayed on Friday they went back they did a CT scan and there were no stones amen and so they sent us that report shared that news with us and thank God and I'm sure there are other other things good things that God did and has done in the lives of his people but we believe in the God who heals amen so we want to take a moment just to pray just to speak healing I want you wherever you are just lay your hand on your own body if you need healing physical healing or emotional healing just lay your hand on your own body and we just got to pray. It's not the fanciful prayer. It's the God who heals. 
right? So don't worry about the prayer itself. We're just making requests. We're just doing what the Lord says. But it's God who heals. So if you have pain in your back, put your hand on your back. If you have pain somewhere else, wherever if you can, if it's not too embarrassing, just lay your hand on that part of your body as a sign that's saying, God, I need your touch. I'm receiving your touch. And then we're just going to pray. Jesus, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are the healer. You are the miracle worker. You haven't stopped healing. You haven't stopped working miracles. So right now, in the name of Jesus, in your name, we command healing to those in this hall, those who are listening. Who are looking to you, we command healing to them in the name of Jesus. That their bodies and minds be made whole in the name of the Lord Jesus. Let them receive their miracle. Let them receive their healing. Let them receive your touch that heals, that delivers, that makes whole. Let bones that have been injured be healed. Let backs be healed. In the name of Jesus. Let every spirit of infirmity, every spirit of pain, every spirit causing sickness and disease, I command you out in the name of Jesus. And let there be healing in His mighty name. Father, we thank you for your healing work. And you restore your people to health and strength. Even as we pray, we thank you, O oh God. We honor you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, what we'd like you to do, just like what this person did, if you experience a healing, please send your testimony in. I know it's been a while since I mentioned this, but send your testimony in. Send an email to testimony at apcw.org. Just share what the Lord has done so that we can you know, share with others the good things the Lord has done. Amen? Now, one last thing before we dismiss. This is the most important thing is for anyone. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, if you've never personally received what Christ did for you through His death, burial, and resurrection, if you don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we want to give you an invitation to do that. The Bible says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So it doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter you know, where you started in life. This invitation is open to every person. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. How do you do it? Tell Him in a simple way. Lord Jesus, I believe in you. As the one who died for my sins on the cross, you were buried, you rose up again. I believe in you. I want to follow you and you alone the rest of my life. You tell Him. And He will do His work in you. So I'm going to lead us in a very simple prayer before we close. And if you have never done this in your life and you feel prompted to do it today, with me. Just pray this prayer with me. If you're watching online, you're welcome to do that as well. Let's take a moment just to pray. If you've never done this in your life before and today you feel prompted to do it, just follow me in this prayer. Just say this with me. Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. Forgive my sins. Become my Lord and my Savior. Make me a child of God and help me to follow you and you alone the rest of my life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Is there anyone here you would prayed this prayer with me for the very first time in your life? We want to celebrate with you. So if you don't mind, just raise your hand with me, please. Anyone here? You prayed this prayer with me for the very first time in your life. Just wave, wave at me. Anyone here? You prayed this prayer with me. We said one person right here. God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Anyone else? You prayed this prayer with me for the very first time. Just wave at me. 
All right. God bless you. God bless you. So our ushers will give you a bag. It says uh, New Believers Bag. There's a card. If you can please write your name and number, hand it back to them. Somebody from the church office will call you and tell you how to use the resources in your bag. Now, one, one last announcement before we dismiss. Today, right after the service, we're having water baptism. Water baptism takes place in the swimming pool right at the back of the auditorium, right? So you will have to please go around and make your way to the swimming pool. Our pastoral team will be there and uh, they will prepare you. They'll have a short time of teaching and the water baptism will happen right there. So if you've come, are prepared for water baptism, please, as soon as the service gets over, uh, please assemble there. 1245, I think, is the time. They will all assemble there. So you have maybe half an hour. Please make, make your way there and the pastoral team will be there. One more announcement. Uh, on Easter Sunday, sorry, neck on, on Good Friday, uh, because it's a combined service, there will be additional parking. So we have the usual basement parking. And if, once the basement is full, they will direct you around to the ground behind us. But the access to the ground is from around uh, the road. So uh, if they say, please go around, they're not chasing you away from church. <laughs> they are just saying, please use the grounds for parking. All right. So Good Friday, just be mindful of that. Because it's a combined service, uh, there'll be a lot of people. So additional parking is on the grounds at the back. And if we need to, we'll do the same on Easter Sunday. Now, make sure you invite some people for Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Some people go to church twice a year, maybe three times a year. So you need to know who they are and invite them for Good Friday, Easter Sunday, and Christmas, and maybe New Year. Right? I'm just joking. Just invite some friends for Good Friday and Easter Sunday. God bless you. Let's close. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, and books, please visit apcw.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, visit apcbiblecollege.org. Do remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the Apple or Google Play Store.